into the depths of our being. Forgive us for when we do not recognize you or when we choose to ignore you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and change this place. Lord, fill us. Humble us in our pride. Strengthen us in our weakness. Bring us back to the foot of the cross. Point us time and time again to Jesus and make real in us the knowledge that we are nothing and we have nothing apart from what we receive from God. We own nothing. We serve no one but our God. Lord, may we know this morning your sweet freedom. May we know the joyous release of letting you be Lord, yet not I but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
Good morning. Let's pray together and then we'll move into announcements. Let's pray. Spirit of God, we have gathered together in this place for worship. Give us faith that as you come like the wind, even though we don't see you, yet we may hear what you're saying to us and discern your movement. Give us courage that we may not fear the tongues of flame. Let all that is unworthy, impure, and sinful be burned from our lives. Lord, we ask that we would know that it is love that burns so brightly and love that strips away all of the wrongdoing in our lives. Give us an open mind, Lord, that the truth that you bring may make its home with us. The deep truth of how this really is would set us free. Truth that would guide us and inform us. Truth that we see ultimately in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that his way would guide us. Give us an open heart, Lord. That we would seek all people for your kingdom. That we would set no limits to the proclaiming of your word. And living and working in the world to build your kingdom. Holy Spirit, with the whole church, we wait for you in every place, in every generation, from the very youngest to the oldest. Father, remind us this morning of who you are. Holy God, Father God, ruling with your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, three in one and one in three. Show us more of you today, Father, and guide us in our worship. And the people of God said... Amen. Amen. It is with sadness that I announce to you the death of Meryl Charlwood, who died on Wednesday past. Her funeral was in this in the church yesterday morning, and hopefully you were able to hear about that before this morning. We did our best to get word out. And our thoughts and prayers are with Douglas and Paul and Philip and Perry and Timothy. And I would encourage you, if you know Douglas, to call and see him over these days and weeks ahead um, and, and support him and, and continue to show him the care that you've been showing him. Um, it is um, at this point in our process we have had the voting election of elders and I will now read the two names that came this is the second week that they'll be read so Peter McKinstry and Alison Orr are the two names that are being put to the congregation who achieved over a third of the vote Um, and so we had permission for up to four that's how our process works you get permission for up to a certain number and then you go through the process Um, and so we have two names from that process and the process is I read the names for two Sundays And under paragraph 179, subparagraph 2, you can tell I enjoy reading this stuff every week. Should any voter desire to make an objection to any of them, they shall lodge their objections with their reasons in writing with the moderator, that's me, of Kirk Session, within a week from the second announcement. Okay, so this is just how the Presbyterian form works. Um, And as part of that, I'm also announcing a congregational meeting after church on Sunday the 2nd of June. So this is your second week of three weeks notice of that meeting. Um, So essentially, after church on the 2nd of June, the congregation will vote that these are the two people who will go forward to become elders. There's then a training process and a presbytery process, and then eventually there'll be a service where they become elders. That's how the process works. So it won't happen probably until mid-autumn, maybe early winter, depending on how it works. But hopefully um, mid-autumn is when we'll do this. Um, So that's that's the the functional part that I need to do. Um, On this Tuesday, committee are meeting at 8. Property subcommittee are meeting at 7. and session are meeting this week, this Thursday at 7. Session are meeting in the church at 7. And then session will move at 8 whenever we, we're just stuck for space. So we'll, we'll begin here. And if you're an elder, you can find us. It might, might be the best way to go. Guides are in, worship teams in, refugees are in. But that's um, our window to meet. Um, can I thank you on behalf of Tear Fund? Last week we had our Tear Fund lunch. So whether, like some people, you went home afterwards and had a second lunch, which some people texted me with a confession later on, um, or whether that was just it. The real point is that we raised £775 for Tear Fund, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing to be able to help them in their work and help other people in other parts of the world. Um, there is an announcement we'll probably share this on WhatsApp about um, a lecture by Trevor Morrow on the 1st of June and the New Irish Choir, but we'll put that on WhatsApp um, after the service. This evening um, is Pentecost Sunday and Newton Abbey churches together are having a service at Carn Money. So really it's an invitation for you to join us tonight at half past six in Carn Money Presbyterian um, along with the Church of Ireland churches 
um, other non-denominational churches and, our, and the Presbyterian churches to gather there um, for worship this evening. So we'd be thrilled if you joined us for that. Um, different clergy will be involved. It's not current money service. It sort of rotates around at different locations, um, but they're going to host it this year, um, which is great that they're able to do that. And I'm going to invite Hazel to come. Sorry, Hazel. Thank you. Um, so this week, I've been thinking about Children's Church over the summer, and I've been challenged by the following verse from Romans, but how can they call him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And we stand at baptism and promise to live our lives in, as a witness to our children, um, and this is one way that you can get involved and fulfil that promise. We'll provide the resources. All you need to do is provide some time during the week to um, understand the story that you want to share with the children and then come along on a Sunday morning and take our lovely young people out to the hall and just spend a bit of time with them sharing the love of Jesus with them. We need two willing volunteers every Sunday from the beginning of June till the end of August. So spaces are limited. Please do sign up very quickly. <laughs> Um, see me afterwards. Um, if you don't see me, I might come see you. It's great, Hazel. It'll be great to cover that. And it's also a great time for you to test that. You might go, I don't want to sign up all year, but I'll do a Sunday in, in, the, in the summer and test out and see whether you might do it again in, in September and, and give a bit more into that. Or maybe you'll just become somebody who's committed every summer to doing it. It'd be great to have your involvement in that. Laura. I'm a talker, so it'll not take very long. Um, what an incredible blessing it is to hear how many things are happening in church that we need volunteers for. It just shows that our church is growing in the ways that we want it to and the youth that's going to be our future. So with that, I ask, come September, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed a lot of goo-goo and gaga going on in the congregation as of late. So there's a lot more babies coming through Glen Gormley. So we're starting up a crash come September. And this is my call for volunteers as well. Um, I will reassure you though, there'll be no nappy changing. Um, there's always going to be a parent present and we only need a volunteer for once every other month. So it's so, so little, like it's in eight weeks, you'll probably literally be doing it once. So it just allows mums to come into the church to be able to enter into worship, to be able to sit and have that break that they deserve um, and be a part of the congregation without having to worry about their wee babies. Um, so yes, if you are willing to do that, men and women, dads are getting involved, everyone's getting involved, um, speak to myself today, Jackie Patterson or Elaine McKinstry. Uh, we're hoping to get it up and going here in the next couple of weeks to get things moving. So I'd appreciate it if you speak to us today. Thank you so much. Great. You can also have a conversation with Hazel or Laura um, or anybody involved and just have a conversation. You don't need to go, if I have a conversation, I have to say yes. You can find out more afterwards. So, so please do do that and follow up with this. Uh, two final pieces. So um, ministers have the ability to take a thing called a sabbatical um, where we're given one week for every year that we work and they accumulate up. So in Within the world of ministers, they're just known as a bank. It's not a bank, but officially they're not called that at all. But anyway, that's what we all call them. Um, but you can't take any more than seven weeks at a time. Um, that's because I think you'd miss me too much and you'd be bereft. So I think that's obviously PCI are sensible about that. Um, but this year I'm going to take four weeks. So I'm going to take four weeks sabbatical. Um, I will be sabbating um, from the 3rd of June through. So I will add, I will add on to this. So I have four weeks sabbatical. I have one week's study leave and then two weeks holiday. So really the headline is I will be... I did say off to another minister, and I was reprimanded because you're not off. I am shabbating is what I'm doing. And so what's going to happen is from the 3rd of June to the 22nd of July is when I'm not in the parish, is the official language. So that's what's happening. So um, I am delighted that George Moore will be preaching and covering for me while I'm off. It is so much better. Well, it's great to have George as anything, just as a statement, it's great to have George, but it's so much better that often what happens is ministers that you don't know would be covering to cover an extended period of time, at which point nobody knows who's really covering it and it changes as it goes through. That's just what happens. So we're, we're very blessed to have George. I'm very grateful for that. But sabbatical, what will I be doing? Honestly, it, it's kind of in the name. 
So the danger is you begin to go, do you have a list of things you're going to achieve while you're Sabbathing? Um, and, and that's not what I'm meant to be doing. So it's meant to be restful and reflective. I think I'm meant to practice what I preach in the sense of God designed us to work and then to rest. I think it would probably be good for my family life if I'm not out for three or four evenings a week. Um, that becomes a standard of our house and how it works. That's before anything else happens. I'm out three to four evenings a week before we do anything as a family or before anything else happens. I do have some books that I'd like to read, but it's not the reading challenge. That's not what it is. It's not just go to the library for, um, for four weeks. I am going to attend a conference in the Outer Hebrides, um, which I'm, I'll talk about maybe briefly later in the service. I'll do some therapy. I think it's probably good to check in and do a little bit of re reflective work and, and look at some things that I'm, I'm aware of in my life. But probably the core question that I'm going to look at is, what is God doing? It's actually to pause and go, so what is God doing? What's God doing in my life, in my family's life, in our church family's life? It's to pause and try to pay attention to that. I think it's probably good for all of us that the minister in Glengormley spends some time at least reflecting on what is God doing in the church family? What is God inviting us to do? What's God been doing over the past, I'm here four years, um, next month? Um, and that strange mix where you called me in February and then COVID came and we came in June. You all wore masks for a year and a half and all of that, but it would be important to reflect on that. So I, it's not a secret where I am. It's the process of how it goes. I'm, I'm keeping some. Um, I'm not taking it all because I do think, without being funny about it, I think if I was away for 10 weeks in the summer, that's quite disorientating at a certain point if you're away for a few months. Um, so from the 3rd of June to the 22nd of July, but I think it's important that as the church family, you're aware of what's happening. I would love your prayers for it. I'd love your prayers for some rest. Um, I've seen my doctor more in the last year than I have done in the last 10. So it'd be nice to not see my doctor, um, although they're lovely, um, but I don't really want to keep going. So there's a couple of things I'd like to rest and, and look at and get checked out and stuff. But the spiritual aspect is what I'd love your prayers for. And even for prayer for us as a family, as maybe the kids might vote to send me back early if I'm around three to four nights a week um, and, and, and get rid of me. So that's what's gonna happen. Um, I'll give you maybe some book recommendations. Not that, yeah, I've, I've some quirky things that I really want to read of my own I, I just, I'm interested in, but I have a couple of, of general things that I'm, I'm going to read, and I might share that with you over next week, and um, do you join me in that? And as far as I'm aware, those are all of the announcements. Today is Christian Aid Sunday. So we had Tear Fund Sunday last week, and it's Christian Aid Sunday this week, and you have this um, in, in, um, in the pews, and I just commend that to you. Hang on, if I, if I had an order, I would tell you what we're going to do next. That'd be great. Derek, it's a good job Derek's here, isn't it? So I'm going to send the boys and girls out because Malachi McCormick is busting to go to Glow. There you go. And if you're a teenager and you're not yet out, you're free to go into the Bernie room. So if you hear some noise in the Bernie room, it's a wonderful thing because we have some teenagers doing some stuff during the service. In the same way that if you have a little one wriggling around you, it's just wonderful that they're here. Jackson's getting back. That's great. And Alan has a Christian Aid video. This is interesting, having had Tear Fund last week. So Christian Aid, I think, works with a different section of, of, of people in the world. Um, so Tear Fund's work has, has morphed into a certain thing, but as you see Christian Aid's work, you'll see where there's possibly slightly different, but also there's still need aid to go in certain directions. Alan, are we able to show the video? Many families in Burundi struggle daily to meet their basic needs. Food and land are in short supply. Healthcare is out of reach for many. The cost of living is soaring. Livelihoods are under threat by droughts, floods and landslides. People are pushed to the brink of survival. My name is Nibogora Alin. I am 35 years old. My favorite people in the whole world are my three sons. I enjoy a lot being with my family. We like traditions and we have a fixed time for praying. It is an opportunity to talk to God because we are still alive thanks to God's grace. We have gone through hardships because I was very poor as I was stuck inside a box. Through 
Through the support of Christian Aid and its partners, Aline and her neighbours were trained to form a village savings and loan association. They each pay in a small amount to build up a group fund and can loan to fund income generating activities. We have three savings groups in this community now. We work together to save and make loans. This has had a great impact on my life. I realized that women can achieve great things. I raise my children alone. I bring them up well. Nobody is going hungry. I managed to buy goats, which helped me a lot, and I bought a bicycle. Carrying goods to our home was difficult before getting a bicycle. We would carry 10 kilograms on our heads. But with a bicycle, be it 100 kilograms or 200 kilograms, you just tie it on and ride quickly. We use it for firewood and crops from the farm. I have a solar panel. I can turn on the lights so that my children can do their homework. And I am building my own home. After finishing my house, I will continue to save with the association because I really wish for my children to study in the university. They are my hope for the future. With your help, we can work towards a world where families can push back against the inhumanity of poverty and fulfill their ambitions. From community events to individual challenges, Christian Aid Week is seven days of action, your way to fund lasting change. Together, we will beat extreme poverty. And so you have an envelope in the, in the pew, and I, I commend this to you. Some figures that may help you, because it seems quite abstract sometimes of what's happening. Um, so 2.9 million people in the last year in, the, in, ter in Christian Aid's reporting, 2.9 million people were reached directly by our long-term work to end poverty, with 17 million people benefiting indirectly, so as it affects the people that they give to directly, it obviously impacts people around them. 3.3 million people benefited from emergency humanitarian support. Their agents through Ukraine provided 34 baby incubators, life-saving drugs for babies born with respiratory conditions, 100 oxygen concentrators and patient monitors, 9,000 thermal blankets, and 9,000 trauma kits. Christian Aid's work is right at the forefront of the places in need in the world. And so I commend it to you. I just bring it to your attention. And if you're able to give, you can take the envelope home and bring the envelope next week. Or even if you forget and you put it in in a few weeks' time, that'll be fine. Um, our guys will be able to, to pass that on to Christian Aid um, as they work with people who are in incredibly distressing, difficult circumstances. We're going to continue in worship in our offering, and as we do that, we're also going to continue to worship.
Stevenson's going to come now and lead us in our prayers for others. Thank you, Mark. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are gathered here this morning to worship you, to praise you, and to thank you. We thank you for all your blessings to us, especially the gift of your Son to save us and the inward peace that is ours when we repent and turn to him. You've given us more than enough for all our needs and what you have given us, we also ask for others. We pray for those in our church family who aren't with us this morning, perhaps because of age or sickness or some other reason. Father, you know the needs of every individual and we ask you to bless them wherever they are. We ask you to use us as faithful witnesses this week to be seen to be living as disciples of Jesus should live and to be ready and willing to give a reason for the hope that we have in us to anyone who asks. We pray that you will use this congregation as a beacon for Jesus shining in Glengormley. Draw those who need Jesus to us, maybe via our organisations or however you see fit. Show us how to reach out beyond the front wall and make contact with the local residents. It is our strong desire that you would use us to reach out and bless others. You've blessed us with religious freedom, so we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Compared to them, we have it easy, but that can result in a lazy or lukewarm faith. Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit to enable us to live for you and grow closer to you day by day. We thank you that Stormont is up and running again. Guide those in government, both there and in Westminster, as they rule over us. Help them to be just and compassionate in the laws they create and implement. We pray that you will overrule in Ukraine, that you will bring an end to the war there, and that a just peace will prevail. We remember the land of Israel and the war there on various fronts, and we pray that you will bless the nation of Israel as you settle them again in their promised land. We pray for peace there. You created the universe and you hold the whole earth in the palm of your hand. Anything is possible with you. And we know that all things are working together in your great plan. As always, we bring our request to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Two weeks ago, we spoke, we, well, we looked at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit from John 14. And Jesus spoke about how if you love God, you are to obey God, which seems obvious because love in simple terms has action at attached to it. We know that in our own lives. We say it in God's love for us, but also in how we love other people. But you see clearly in Scripture that God sent Jesus because he loves us. Jesus came, lived, died, rose again, and is exalted today in the heavens because he loves us. If you're a disciple of Jesus, having surrendered your life to him, then that love that you receive from Jesus has action in the world as you do what Jesus did and loves the world. Jesus goes far, far further from God. Well, 
This morning we're going to look at a passage in Acts 2 that is in some ways so well known that you're inured to it. You know what happens. There's no surprise. I'm not going to read it and you're going to go to change the ending this year. You're not, it's, like, it's like Christmas. You'll read it and go, we know what's happening in this story. But this morning what really is what we mark is the start of the church as we know it. Is the start of being empowered by God to live in this life. What you have in Acts chapter 1 is the beginning of this, where you have a group of about 120 in size, the 12 disciples, along with the women, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus' own brothers. And it says in chapter 1, verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And you find the beginning of a worshiping community. They're told to stay in Jerusalem, and so they're obedient, and they do that, and they stay there not really knowing what's going to happen next. It's easy for us to read it and see what the story is. But these people didn't see this. But I'd love you to hold the link today that what we're about to read comes in in line of what we read at the very start from Song of Solomon. He does this because he loves us. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost because he loves us, because of God's love and care for us. So let's read from Acts 2 together. And you can follow it along on the screen. You can read it from the Pew Bible But because Luke is such a great reader, you can just close your eyes and listen to it. You can just hear the story. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites... Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then... Peter goes on essentially to give the first sermon. He goes on to then explain who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And he goes on through that, explaining that. And in verse 38, he simply declares, well, the people heard this in verse 37, Alan, if we can jump. Sorry for putting you under pressure there. In verse 37, when the people heard this, when they heard the first sermon, the first preach, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily 
those who are being saved. And you have the beginning of the Christian church. What Luke records, as Luke does throughout Luke and Acts, is incredibly short. The Holy Spirit coming, he really reduces down to probably 10 or 12 lines, not even, sorry. 2, 4, 6, 8, 11 lines. That's it. Changes the world. The sign is like a blowing of a violent wind. And somehow, as he describes this, the wind fills the place they're in. Wind always fills the place it's in. If your back door is open for your kitchen, the wind fills it. It's a strange thing as he describes this. It's almost like he can't describe it. They were in a room and wind, wind filled the place. And then they say what seemed to be like tongues of fire. It doesn't even really make sense. A tongue of fire. You don't, it's not a term you use. You're not sitting in the house at winter and you go, oh, there's a good, good tongues of fire coming off the fireplace tonight. It looks language for this. It almost doesn't help us. Wind filled the place and there seemed to be tongues of fire that came into the space. And the tongues of fire split off and rested on each of them. And all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit and enables them to speak in other tongues. It's a really detailed and accurate. But also, it's confusing in the story. It's like everything else that Luke writes. There's a bit where you go, this gives us enough information. But also, it just raises a whole set of questions where you'd love to interview Luke and go, what happened? What did people say? What was going on here? But what you have is not a theoretical thing. It moves outside the room quite quickly because these people could speak actual other languages. You have a long list of countries, regions, and areas, and these people can hear in their own language, and they describe what they hear with the action of God's Holy Spirit upon his followers is that these people are declaring the wonders of God. That's what the other people say. These people are talking to me in a language I understand, and they're talking in the wonders of God. Our Lily is heading towards the summer exams in Form 2, and Lily has discovered that her Form 2 French is ahead of my GCSE French. My ability with languages is almost certainly nil. She looks at me like I'm, my accent doesn't help me, but also the words have left me. They've left me completely. I do not have a skill of languages. And yet what Luke describes here is this group of people went out into the city and they declared the wonders of God, that's what people heard, in the language the people were in. They testify, they give account, they tell their story, they get out of the room. There's no training course. There's been no three steps to share in what you believe. There's no overthinking this. The presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives produces action in their lives. They do the work of God's kingdom in Jerusalem. And in verse 13, some people made fun of them. As they speak of the wonders of God, some people, it's not persecution, it's really just jest. They're just being mocked for what they're doing. And then in verse 14, Peter the rock, the one who cut off an ear in the garden, the one who denied Jesus three times, the one who wondered what John would be doing in the kingdom of God whenever he was told what, it, what would be happening to him. He declares they're not drunk. God is pouring out his spirit on all people. This is, I think, a little bit hard for us to understand because we are the beneficiaries of all people. You're not Jewish. You're not there 2,000 years ago. You weren't in the room. And yet what the declaration is from Joel, which is even further back, is God's Holy Spirit will be on all people. There's no asterisk. There's no bit at the bottom. of. The, if you look up the Pew Bible, there's no bit saying, well, apart from people a few generations from now, or apart from the Hibernians on an island in northwest Europe, or however you want to describe us 2,000 years ago, before there were flags and other things. No, no, all people. God's Holy Spirit will be on all people. And then it goes into even more detail because it's almost like Luke, God, using Luke, knows that we will try to get out of this. Everybody in all countries, races, areas, genders, men and women, young and old. And then again, as we have it in Acts, men and women are named again. The action of the Holy Spirit in our lives leads to prophecy for sons and daughters. God's work, God's work is for all. It's not limited by age. Gender isn't the block. Race isn't the block. And as Peter quotes Joel from verse 16, I will pour out my spirit in those days. It's a plentiful thing. It's a pouring. It's not some people in the church will get a gifting. Some people in the church will have Holy Spirit. Some people won't. It is the idea that if you are a follower of Jesus, God's interaction and transformation that happens when you surrender your life to Jesus is that the Holy Spirit moves into everyone's life. It's for everybody. As, apart from making all larger in Acts, as you read it in the Pew Bible, Luke, as he writes this, couldn't make it any more obvious that this is for absolutely everybody who is a follower of Jesus. Peter describes that anyone can have this. And to make it even more clear, at the end in verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Peter then uses the Psalms as he's talking to fellow Jews and he's explaining this to him. He uses what they will know to explain this. And their response is, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, what shall we do? They hear their context of the good news and they go, what shall we do? It's the first opportunity of the, really the first ad hoc sermon on the street and people respond, what shall we do? And he explains, repent, turn from your life, turn from your old life, be baptized, declare your faith in Jesus and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then just in case, again, the Bible's really clear about some of this. This is for you and your children and for all here who are here and for all who are far off. We're the far off ones. Nobody even knew we existed up in the frozen rainy north. It's for everyone. So 2,000 years later, what does this mean for us? Part of it is the same invitation, repent, turn from your old life, turn out of the stuff that you shouldn't be doing, turn away from that life that is not serving God's kingdom, be baptized. In our tradition, that's often done at birth as a sign of God's covenant, because we have Christian tradition here. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you choose to follow Jesus with your life, when you surrender your life to him. It doesn't say some of you. It doesn't say maybe. It just names the spiritual reality of surrendering your life to Jesus, accepting his sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit. Which means that if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you already have the Holy Spirit in you. I don't know if Luke, as he writes Acts, can make that any more clearer. All ages, all genders, for all time, including your children, including the old people, all people. He just names it over and over and over again. Possibly this morning as you hear this, you're going, I actually haven't done this. I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus. In which case, that's the thing that you should pay attention to this morning. The space of who's running my life? Who, do I, who have I surrendered my life to? Who's teaching me how to live in this life? But the invitation that we have here is actually the reality of how life is to be as followers of Jesus. Jürgen Moltmann wrote, and I won't quote German theologians very often because really none of you care, let's be honest. You don't really mind who Jürgen Moltmann is. I could have said he plays for Berlin FC and you would have fallen for it. That's really what's happening. So Jürgen Moltmann said, Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural demonized and wounded. And I think it's really helpful if you're a follower of Jesus to see that God's kingdom has begun and is getting larger and larger in the world. And ultimately, as we read the Bible, it will come to fullness on earth. And actually then what is natural in the world is how God's doing things. And the natural world that we live in actually isn't natural at all. It's completely rinsed with sin and brokenness and damage and damage caused to you and damage caused by you and damage caused by other people and damage caused by doing the right thing and doing the wrong, all those combinations. That's the world we live in. We don't need to sell that. We've just had Christian aid telling us that there's people dying of hunger. There's brokenness in the world. But what's actually happening in the world is God's kingdom has taken root through the, through the incarnation of Jesus and Jesus showing us who God is and dying for us and rising again from the dead and reigning at the right hand of Jesus. But that goes even further because the Holy Spirit moves into us. Indwells is the theology term. The Holy Spirit is in your life if you're a follower of Jesus. And all that's going to happen is that's going to get greater. So at the very end, we are with God where he is forever, as I explained yesterday at Merrill Charwood's funeral. This is where our hope is, that we will be with God where he is forever and his kingdom will be, will be in fullness. And so as we live in the world, and some of this is like, this is a bit odd that they can speak foreign languages. Really? For God's kingdom, where people will all believe and everyone will bow the knee all over the world at the end? This is just God working things out, that he empowers his people to do this. There's a danger this morning that what I do is I give you some element of an English comprehension of the passage. I walk you through it, you get to go, oh, that's what happened, that's lovely. What does this mean in your life? If you're a follower of Jesus in 2024 and you're going about, you're living and working and being, what difference does the Holy Spirit make? Or is it just a one-off Sunday where I say some things and people go, oh, that's lovely, thanks very much. I'm going to Stornoway in my sabbatical. I'm going to a conference on the Outer Hebrides. I've, Malachi is very distressed because I've never been away. I know some of you travel for work and you're away all the time. In our house, we're very local. I've never been away. He was like, but will you be okay? It's only three nights. It's only three nights. The, the, the Presbyterian budget only goes for three nights. So that's, 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 that's the kid he spent. And he's like, and then he went, 
will you still be married? And we're like, okay, Miles, we have a whole other thing we need to discuss here of how you think this works. But maybe that's just when you're 10 and your dad's always been around in the neighborhood and that's different. I know some of you travel for work all the time. That's a very different dynamic to engage with. Um, but I'm going to go to Stornoway for three nights for a conference that happened there. But between 1949 and 1953, there was a work of God in Stornoway and in the islands. And the work of God began because people in the local church were so distressed at the fact that young people weren't in church. That's where some of it began. And they prayed, and they were, they were praying in utter desperation. The prayers that have been recorded are so on the edge of what you would say to God. They were desperate. There is no, dear God, we come before you in holiness and virtue. No, no, dear God, for your reputation, kick in. It's holy, holy local people who are desperate. And what happened was God began to move and moved for four years. And there's some people who are still alive. Maybe I'll get to meet them, maybe I won't. But the, the local churches there still have a conference to, 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 to honor God for what happened, but also to ask God for a move, a move of God in the world, a move of God where we are. Um, I'm really excited about going. I'm really nervous about going because I want more of God's presence in my life. And I don't talk about that very often. I know you might have tradition in, in Ulster of preachers who will talk about revival all the time. I think it becomes almost... I understand it comes from a very good place, but it becomes almost a, a thing that we talk about. And I, I feel very closely. I've felt marked by it for a long time. I want God to move. I want God to move in our church family. I want God to move in your life and in my life. Uh, it's really a pilgrimage, which is a very un-Presbyterian word. You could write that down and send that to church house. Our minister was talking about pilgrimages. He's going on one, an inquiry on this. But I have a sense of wanting to go where God moved. God moved for four years. And they had the experience of coming to church. And they were in church and they were... A service of church and they would leave and people would be in the car park and people in the community were so compelled by God's work in their homes as they were lighting the fire and eating their dinner that they were drawn to church and not that it's about coming into the building they were drawn under the presence of God and they wanted to be there so they would do church in the evening they would have a second church service they would then leave the second church service at about 11 and then on the way home they would they didn't want to go home they went why would you sleep when you could be in the presence of God that's unnerving. It's unnerving. Okay, why would you sleep if you could be in the presence of God? And they met in local barns or in fields in the Hebrides. I would think it's hardcore for me, the idea of being outside in the Hebrides. And they just were like, why would you sleep? We can be together and be in God's presence. And people came to faith and came to faith and came to faith all across the islands. People were found at the side of the road on their knees because the presence of God was on them in such a way that they could not go any further without getting right with God. I think that's an incredible move of God's Holy Spirit. Well, that sense of urgency. I've been blessed by that once in my life, where I got a phone call from a local guy when I was over in Ballyselon, and he phoned me, and he went, I didn't know him, it was a straight, I was on my day off, and he phoned and went, I need, can I talk to you? I was like, all right. I can see it tomorrow. And he went, okay. And then he went, look, I need to get right with God. And I was like, okay. I was thinking, has he done something? Something happened where he's getting right with God before the police come. I was like, I don't know what this is. I've no, I've no experience of this. And so I met Stephen. He goes, uh, he was a taxi driver. And he said, I, I was like, I could see you today. And he went, I can be at the church in 10 minutes. And I was like, I was in my jammies. So I was like, all right, I'll be at the church in 10 minutes, on with the clothes, up to the church. And he went, I need to get right with God. And I need to do it now. And I don't know what to do. And I need to do it right now. And I can't say that I led him to the Lord. I sat beside a man who was so desperate for the Lord, he was, he was trying to pull, pull the Holy Spirit into him. It's incredible, incredible moment. And on Sunday, he came to church. His nuclear family came to church. The, he said, no, he had grandkids and everything, they all came. Uh, the in-laws came. The first four pews were full because he came to faith on Tuesday because he couldn't wait any longer. He couldn't even wait until I was going, I can meet you tonight. And he was like, I'm in the neighborhood, 10 minutes. Such was the presence of God moving around him and on him. And he would say he was in church when he was a teenager. He had a sense of it, but it didn't. And then he didn't have the, the theological, who cares about the theological language? He was like, I need to get right with God today. I was like, well, allow me to pray with you. But you're, in my head, I'm going, you're already saved. You've already given your life to Jesus. You can't wait any longer. You're desperate for him. I want that for us. I want that for me. And so we read Pentecost and you read the Holy Spirit comes and you get this sense where you see it in the world. You see people who are desperate for this. And I think that's an important part of us as a church is that we want people to come to faith. It's all very safe and nice because it involves other people. 
So what does it mean for us this week? What does it mean in 2024 that you have the Holy Spirit within you and God sends you out into the world at you know, 10 minutes time? How does this work? The Holy Spirit is in you. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms given to us by God. That's what Ephesians describes. Every spiritual blessing. It's not you get to pick two out of five. Everyone comes to us. What you have in Pentecost, I think it's incredible the Holy Spirit comes. But the story really is about being outside the room. There's a danger at times that we think that the Holy Spirit coming is about being in church. What you have in Acts 2 is the Holy Spirit comes among God's people. And it's the first time that happened. That's why it's recorded. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And then what do you do with that? I think part of that, I'll give you some practical things to do, is to ask him. Is to just ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Now that is a terrifying prayer. It's really short, there's no wiggle room, there's no holy language to get around anything. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Or Holy Spirit, what do you want me to know? Maybe you've got your neighbours. We've got neighbours and I've never spoken to them about Jesus. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to know? I might not like the answer to that. Because I'm the one in Dalewood, you're not there. But you have neighbours. What's the Holy Spirit doing? Go to work tomorrow? Or not even before you go to work tomorrow? Even your own family? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to know? And then it's pausing long enough to hear him. Just pausing. Pausing in prayer to go, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Because you have a thousand voices racketing around your head. I'm I'm going on sabbatical on the 3rd of June and my to-do list has just gone. It's just, it's insane what we're trying to get finished before I go off so things can happen over the summer, which is great. But there's loads of voices for my time at the minute. And the danger in all of our lives is there's loads of voices for your time and actually you're paying no attention to what the Holy Spirit's doing. It doesn't happen deliberately. It happens by accident. You just go through your life and you're not really listening for what the Holy Spirit's doing. What you have here is the rest of Acts. You should read this afternoon because people are listening to the Holy Spirit and doing things and the church just grows and grows and grows. So, may your prayer today is to go, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? In my family, with my kids, with my grandparents, with my parents, with my aunts and uncles, whoever's, whatever shape your family is in. Maybe it's your friends. What is it you want me to know? Lord, Holy Spirit, lead me. And then, and then just to listen. And, and maybe it'll come as a, a thing that you'll hear, or maybe you'll get a picture of something, or maybe you'll get an idea. We did this in session on Tuesday because we're looking for somebody to do a role. And so we paused and we prayed. And we prayed fairly simply for taking this seriously. Holy Spirit, bring to mind somebody in the church family who would do this. And I had an idea in my head. And I scribbled it down and pointed it to the person beside me. And he went, I just thought of him. Is that the Holy Spirit? I don't know. But we'll approach that person and ask them. And maybe, hopefully, the Holy Spirit will be speaking to them. And they'll go, I was thinking I might be able to do that. But it's moving from a place where you leave the kingdom of you being in charge of your life to go and the Holy Spirit's in charge of your life. Which is actually what the big battle's about. Of who's in charge of your life. So I say, you surrender your life to Jesus. Well then, send to Jesus. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. Who do you want me to be with? Or when you go to work, or you're teaching children, or you have patients, or customers, or you have any of the combinations, people beside you in an office, any of those combinations, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to know today? What do you want me to know about these kids? What do you want me to know about these adults? What do you want me to know about these patients? What do you want me to know about these customers? What do you want me to know about? What do you want me to do? What do you want, what do you want me to be part of here? It's not just I'm here to earn. Yes, you are there to earn money to feed your family, pay the bills, do that. Yes, but God's placed you in the world with the Holy Spirit in you as part of His kingdom in the world. Lord, what do you want me to do? I was talking to somebody this week, I'm not, I'm not going to mention them, and they were in with their doctor, and they said to me, as we were having a pastoral conversation about how they were doing, they went, ah, just encouraged them a wee bit and shared a wee bit of a wee bit of word. And I was like, all right. You were in for a, for a doctor's appointment where they were discussing quite major things about your life, and in the middle of that, you found, I, I hope, an appropriate way to share a little bit of faith. You don't need to do Peter, stand up and announce the whole history of the Jewish faith and how it all works. But it is the beginning to go, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? You're in me. It looks really clear about that. Everybody, if you have faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you. you. You need to have a problem with Luke and with God if you think you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. It's their idea. That's what it says. So if you're going, I don't have the Holy Spirit in me, within me, you, you need to talk to God about that. 
Because maybe the Holy Spirit's within you and you're, you don't experience it. Or have it. Holy Spirit, show me that you're working on my life. Show me that this is the reality of my life. And then just apply it where you're placed. I don't work where you work. I don't live in your street. I don't have your family. You don't have mine. We're probably both glad about that. That's how that goes. But what's, what's God prompting you with? I'm going to be honest. Some of you are already incredible at this. Some of you just live in this pattern in your life where you do things that are only guided by God, giving you nudges and moves and think people, and you just live in that rhythm. And what happens is it just increases because you're, you're able to discern the Holy Spirit leading you in your life. Some people in Glengormley Church are exceptional at this, at operating in their world, at doing this. But the danger of reading on Pentecost Sunday Acts 2 is that we go, oh, that was lovely back then, nice wee story. And essentially it's a once upon a time story. And that's not what the story is. The story is the birth of the church that you have the Holy Spirit within you and God calls us to get out of the room. So we're going to put this in practice now. And some of you won't like this, but that's okay because I'm going to go on sabbatical and I won't be here for seven weeks. Um, so I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to pray for us that you would have a sense of the Holy Spirit's leading. That's it. There's no extra bit to that. It's just asking that God, show us what you want us to do. What comes to mind? And I'm going to invite you, and I'm only going to invite you just to open your hands in front of you. You don't have to do that. That's, that's between you and the Lord. But that's space. I find it helpful at times to open my hands because I go, I'm bringing nothing to this, and I also want God to fill my hands. While I also don't want God to fill my hands, because when God speaks to you, then, as my lovely wife tells me, if God told you to do it, you better get on with it and not delay. So there's a danger in that. That space of just opening your hands. And we'll pause for just really 20 seconds. Now I'm going to lead us in a very simple prayer. We're just taking this seriously of what we read next to you. Let's pray. Father God, as we read at the start, your desire is for us. You love us. And you love us so much you sent your son, Jesus. And you love us so much you sent the Holy Spirit to be the foundational reality of our lives. All because you love us. We're not on our own. You are with us. Father, we simply pray that the Holy Spirit would tell us what we need to know. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us, prompt us in what to do in different areas of our lives. We know that you will resource this. We know that you will give us the ability to do this because that's what we find in Acts. They have the ability to do this. And so, Father, as things come to mind, Father, forgive us where we just feel afraid as we think of people and circumstances. But prompt us, Father, to be able to hear your voice. We pray against all the other voices in our heads. In the name of Jesus, we pray against them that you would silence the voices of fear, the voices from the other guy, that we would hear you and your spirit most of all. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing in response, My Jesus, I love thee, which is a fabulous sentence. which is why the band have paused, because I announced the wrong song. We're going to sing the actual last, last praise that's down, because people are going to start playing different tunes. So that was my fault. Sorry about that. <laughs>
say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.